morning. Uh, my name is Jim Sumande, and for those of you who don't know me, I am the uh, Klamath Branch Supervisor for NOAA Fisheries. And so uh, today I'm going to be talking about stressors influencing the viability of Shasta Scott and Upper Klamath uh, populations, and, and uh, the presenters before me certainly touched on some of those stressors. And we're going to dig deeper a little bit into some of those stressors here now. And as you know, as I was putting this presentation together, I was realizing, boy, this, is, this has got the potential to be a real downer presentation. So I hope to uh, leave you at least with a, a, a note of optimism at the end, so hang with me, please. <laughs> and so the purpose of today's presentation is to first characterize the historical ecological conditions which the, uh, the species evolved under. And I'll talk a little bit about flow, temperature, and habitat conditions. Next, I'll be uh, describing these key stressors which have been limiting interior Klamath Co. population production and viability. And this provides a context for the supplementation uh, discussions to follow by providing this baseline description. And uh, for orientation purposes, uh, MAP was already put up there on the board, but uh, three populations focusing here on the Scott River, the Shasta River, and then the, uh, the upper Klamath population unit, which historically extended to Spencer Creek, which is above J.C. Boyle Dam. Currently, uh, habitat is blocked at Iron Gate Dam. It's the main stem and those other tributaries besides the Shasta and the Scott. <clears throat> and the, uh, the environment uh, historically uh, certainly was idyllic, uh, as illustrated in this uh, painting from the 1870s, not only for, uh, for white settlers coming to the area, but also overall indications for coho salmon as well. Some of the key characteristics of the interior climate basin include warm, dry summers, cool, cold winters, and uh, very important is the, uh, yes, right up to my, okay, very good. Uh, snowmelt and volcanic spring hydro hydrology, which dominates these systems. This is important because as the flows attenuate through the spring into the summer, it provides stable flows, cold flows, uh, and large networks of areas historically for coho salmon to oversummer in. And uh, historically, the valley floors were often historic wetlands. As illustrated here in this topo map from uh, the 1870s, where you see noted here uh, wetlands in the Scott Valley area between Fort Jones and Edna, as well as a uh, large network of wetlands also in the Shasta, Upper Shasta region as well. And you can imagine this was Coho Habit back in its time. We already saw the, uh, the one uh, illustration of Bennett's estimate of unimpaired flows. Here's another estimate of unimpaired flows. Uh, Mike Diaz, who's here today, uh, provided this in 2004. And while there's differences in the uh, summer base flow here, the same point applies, and that is that you have uh, a significant amount of water estimated in the Shasta River main stem, which uh, led the NRC in 2004 to conclude that provided cold water refugia, not only through the main stem Klamath, well, excuse me, the main stem Shasta, but to the mouth of the Klamath as well, historically. So there's a, a lot of factors that made habitat in the upper Klamath region here, ideal for coho salmon, low gradient habitat, wetlands, um, stable flows for oversummering. These were enhanced as well by beavers, which pr pr proliferated uh, certainly in the Shasta and the Scott River Valleys and added a lot of complexity to that habitat. So overlaid on top of this historical condition have been a number of stressors and I'm defining stressors for this talk as the physical or biological response to anthropogenic or natural events that adversely affect individuals. And I'm going to hit on some key stressors now. The first one I'm pointing out is altered hydrology, and here we see uh, a decadal plot of the Shasta and the Scott. And whereas before we saw flows in the neighborhood of 100 CFS during the summertime, here we're seeing flows dropping down closer to 10 CFS at the summertime. And of course, this is probably having a significant effect on habitat suitability, limiting those areas, constraining those areas to areas close to cold water refugia and springs. 
we see a similar type of a hydrology as well on the Scott River side. Altered hydrology is also affecting the main stem Klamath as well. Whereas historically we saw the peak of the hydrology in the middle of May, we've seen a shift in the hydrology over time, <coughs> moving it up closer to early April. And this has had a significant effect when you think about habitat suitability, availability during smolt down migration and juvenile rearing through the spring months. Water quality conditions are impaired, and as such, the EPA is listed under TMDL's water quality bodies, including in the Upper Klamath, the Shasta, and the, and the Scott River populations. And the general uh, water quality impairments that affect coho salmon are, low, uh, are temperature, high temperatures, uh, low dissolved oxygen, and in the Scott River, elevated sediment as well. In terms of impaired water quality, here we see uh, a simulation in the Shasta River where at three different flows we see the effects of um, uh, flow on temperature as we move from the source to the mouth and uh, of particular note is the uh, steep increase in temperature uh, proximal to the source when flows are as low as 10 CFS. On the Scott River side, we see a rather irregular um, relationship between temperature over distance, where you see the uh, effects of key uh, tributaries providing groundwater intrusion, and then temperatures increasing in places where groundwater is not influencing. Exacerbating these uh, water temperature and water quality effects has been the reduction in complex riparian habitats. And this is not only affecting temperature by reducing shading, but it's also reducing the amount of complexity and habitat structure to the stream, which Coho prefer as well. The, uh, the large proliferation of beavers that once existed in the valleys all but extinct in the 1920s. This is from a DFG report where 1,800 beavers were being captured annually in the 1850s, and they were all but extirpated by the 1920s. Sediment supply has been altered in uh, different ways across the landscape. Here we see an illustration of elevated fines in the area where uh, decomposed granitics uh, erode easily and are impacting uh, pool habitat, which is reducing the habitat suitability for, uh, for juvenile coho, also having effects on spawning habitat as well. Whereas on the, Sha on the uh, Shasta side and in the main stem Klamath, we see actually a, re a, uh, a reduction in coarse sediment occurring, which is reducing the amount of spawning habitat as well. Here we see a, uh, an illustration of uh, a large, profound effect to floodplain and channel characteristics as a result of uh, historic mining on the Scott River side. Uh, this has had both effects in terms of uh, destroying wetland habitat, which once was here historically, uh, impacting riparian zones, and also affecting uh, channel maintenance flows. Uh, and of course this had significant effects downstream as well. And to top it off, uh, coho salmon leaving the tributaries have to contend with uh, high rates of disease during certain times of the year. Uh, Ceratomyxa shasta, parvicapsula, mini bicornis, two infectious diseases uh, impact uh, salmonid populations in the Klamath River at inordinate levels. We have seen rates as high as 50% of fish sampled infected by these diseases. And uh, the disease rates are, can be very high in the Shasta to Scott River reach. And while mostly today we're going to be, and tomorrow, we're going to be mostly talking about the benefits of hatchery in terms of supplementation, there's been significant adverse hatchery related impacts as well. Over time, certainly the genetic impacts, which have reduced the productivity of populations. 
competition for limited resources, for example, when there's large releases of smolts in the river and habitat is limited to the main stem, wild fish have to compete with those, with those hatchery fish for, for locations. And then finally, predation. Uh, as a result of residualized steelhead below the uh, Iron Gate Dam, predation has also increased. And so what I want to leave you with is this conceptual model where historically you see in an unconstrained environment, habitat capacity is reaching its full potential. And the biota, in this case coho salmon, were allowed to adapt over this uh, diversity of habitat. And by doing that, they are setting themselves up for persistence to environmental change. What we see over time are the anthropogenic effects constraining those habitat opportunities. Similarly, the populations are also constrained as well. This is where we want to go. We want to go into a desired future condition where we're having uh, meaningful restoration, which is re-expressing habitat capacity, and we expect the population to respond accordingly. So reasons for optimism. Well, there's a number of them. First of all, there's been a lot of effective restoration in these basins, and we're going to hear about that just in a few minutes when Dave talks. There's recovery guidance now on the street. Both agencies, Department of Fish and Game and NOAA Fisheries, providing roadmaps to help us prioritize restoration leading towards recovery. There's habitat conservation plans, both being implemented and soon to be implemented, which are going to uh, uh, result in large-scale improvements uh, across the landscape. And there's a potential for large-scale long-term restoration through the agreement process. And there's been a lot of hatchery reform as well, and we're going to hear about that later too when there's a talk on the HGMP. And then finally, there's a lot of community support. We, and this is the most important of it all because the agencies know we're not able to do this alone. We need the support of the communities if we're going to bring back the fish. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. I ran into Jim last night. We happened to be having dinner at the same place in, uh, here in Wairika. And I said, Jim, just keep it crisp, please. Well, he kept it incredibly crisp. I want an extra round of applause. This is the model. And this is the classic win-win, because now we, we have a few extra minutes uh, for talk before we'll take uh, our, uh, our morning break. So heart-pounding questions for, for Jim here. Okay. My name is Don Meamber. I'm a rancher from Montague. And I just want a clarification, Jim. You mentioned uh, the high disease rate in the Scott and Shasta reaches. <coughs> and to clarify, you did mean on the Klamath River. Because I did, on, the, on the main stem Klamath River yeah, between the Shasta and the Scott. As I understand it, no, no fish has ever been found diseased in the Shasta or the Scott River. They get disease once they reach the Klamath. But that's my understanding is well done. Thank you. Other questions for Jim? Sure. My name is Michael Stapleton. And you mentioned something. There, there's this not enough suitable habitat. Um, I own almost a mile of French Creek. In Scott Valley, we have lots of incredible habitat, 50 degree water all summer long. We just need more adults. So something that could be done to get more adults up the river would be um, very beneficial. And I kind of say the taboo word, maybe, you know, changing the netting, the gill netting, you know, reduce it during the fall when the, sh when the coho are in the, the Klamath. Is that a possibility? Um, whatever can be done. We have the habitat. We just need more adults. And... Thank you. I appreciate you letting us know about the, uh, the habitat in your area. That's, that's really good to know. And uh, there certainly are those key areas of refugia which exist today. And uh, the species is certainly taking advantage of them. Okay. Other questions? Uh, Michael Cops of Siskiyou County. Uh, thank you, Mr. Simmonde, for being here today. Um, with regard to spawners and their return, um, what capacity would that bring? to the Shasta and the Scott 
with regard to um, smolts eventually going out. If we had more spawners, would we have more smolts, smolts come going out that eventually would increase um, the populations that we're looking for? Thank you. Well, it's, it's my opinion that we need to have the uh, habitat conditions that allow for survival to ensure that you do get the returns and productivity over time. And uh, we see uh, when conditions are good, uh, freshwater survival is greater. Certainly ocean conditions have a lot to do with returns as well. But uh, the combination of improving habitat along with increasing numbers uh, should result in uh, increased productivity. Jack Rice with California Farm Bureau. I had a question about your, uh, or the temperature changes in the river and how they reflect flows. <coughs> are those temperatures average? Are they like surface temperatures? Or does it vary throughout parts of the stream? Are there little refugia of colder water? How does that system work? Is it more complex than just one number? Yeah, the, the simulation that I shared with you is from the NRC document, uh, Threatened Endangered Fish at the Klamath River Basin. It's an, it's an avid study. And I can't tell you exactly uh, how that information was collected. I'm assuming that it's, it was modeled. It was certainly modeled uh, without uh, consideration of riparian shading. Um, but I can look into that for you if you'd like. All right, well, let's uh, give Jim an applause. And we're going to take a morning break here.